thank you very much all for coming. Uh, and uh, for those of you who haven't met me before or been here, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney. Um, I am at a firm called Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us. I do nothing but this. Uh, if you've got other kinds of problems and you want to talk to me about them, I'm happy to have you talk to one of the other 59. Among us, we know a lot of stuff. Uh, and all I know is elder law, and I do a lot of presentations here for a year. Uh, and once a year, I just try to do one that is just an update. You know, I try to do some seminars that are really very special, specialized in terms of focusing on mass health issues or protecting your home or whatever. But this is the broader, so you're 65 or older and you have got issues, and what are those issues? And they're pretty much all the ones that we're going to talk about today. So what is your goal? Now, you've met my, my, my couple before. Oh, I hope I haven't run out of juice. This is not looking good. Ah, excuse me. See now, and actually he's going he's to keep filming while I do this, right? How bad is this? Put that in here. Look at that. You've met my friends Frank and Mary before, and their children Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Um, and you know that their goal in life is very simple. They want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. Uh, if all things being equal, if one of them dies, they want their spouse to get everything. And if they're both dead, they want things divided up among their kids. That's, their ba that's kind of the basic, and that may not be you, uh, but it is a lot of people. So, but those are the kind of the, the, that's kind of the thinking that we're going to be kind of talking about today. Now, these folks obviously don't live on Nantucket. Their house is only worth $300,000, right? Um, and they've got an IRA and an annuity and some bank accounts, and their total value is $625,000. And he's got Social Security of $1,500 and a pension of $500 for a total of $2,000, and she's got Social Security of $750. Uh, and so their quest, they come to me, I see these kinds of folks a whole lot, right? And, and one of their first kind of questions always is, so don't I need a will? Don't I need a will? Doesn't a will get me out of probate? Well, actually, no, a will doesn't get you out of probate. But the real question is, in this situation, with their goals, do they need a will? And the answer is, uh, if there is a are assets that are going to be going through probate, through the probate court, and probate is there to deal with assets that you own in your individual name at the time that you die. If you own something jointly with somebody else, then at the moment you die, your interest evaporates and the other person becomes the sole owner. If you have a life estate in your house, many people here may have life estates in their house because they've transferred the remainder interests in the house to you, their children for various mass health planning purposes. If they did that, then when your life estate, when you die, your life estate evaporates. Your kids become the sole owners. Nothing is going through probate. So if, if, if you are, plan but if you're going through probate and you're Frank and Mary and your goal is if one of us dies, I want to leave everything to the other one. And if we're both dead, I want to leave everything to our kids. Well, you don't need a will for that. That's exactly what happens if you don't have a will. That's what the Massachusetts law is. It's called the rules of intestacy. It used to be, until about three years ago, that that wasn't the case. That if you died owning something and you had a spouse and kids, your spouse got half and the kids got half. Well, that's not what anybody kind of expected. They all figured that every, their spouse would get everything, but that wasn't the law. Well, the law changed finally, to reflect what most people think what the law was supposed to be. So that's what the law is. So people will say, so what do I, so I'll say, well, you know, you don't really need a will in this case unless you're trying to avoid probate, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. What you do need, you need three things. You have to have a health care proxy, a power of attorney, and a MOLST form. A MOLST form. Raise your hands if you know what a MOLST form is. Wow, that's the highest percentage of any presentation I've done this year, like 10%. That's really <laughs> high. Um, Oh, because I've done it before. Oh, you remembered. You, you remembered. So MOLS stands for Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. It has replaced or is replacing the so-called DNR or Do Not Resuscitate forms um, that had been done. Uh, the Department of Public Health is encouraging the use of the MOLS forms. We're going to talk about those a little bit. So you have to have a health care proxy. And the reason is if you're incapacitated and you can't make a medical decision, uh, no one can make that decision legally for you. Now, a lot of times, if you've got a spouse, and the, spa and the doctor will talk to the spouse and kind of give that rule a pass, but he's not supposed to. Legally, no one can make a medical decision for you. Your spouse, your kids, nobody, unless you've given them the right to do that. 
And the only way you do that is through a health care proxy, not through a power of attorney, not through any other document. And any things that you've done, you know, like living wills, here's how I want to be treated, blah, 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 none of that's enforceable. None of that is legally enforceable. Le uh, living wills are not enforceable in Massachusetts. They are in many states. That's why when you look at, 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 the, at websites and stuff and you see all this national stuff, you see a lot of living will stuff, none of it's enforceable. So if you've got a particular way that you want to be treated, you want to tell your proxy how you want to be treated because they're going to make all of the decisions, 100% of the decisions. Even if you have a, a most form, even if you've said, if I'm on the floor and the EMT shows up, don't resuscitate me. If you're on the floor and the EMT shows up and your daughter, the proxy is there and she says, I want my mother resuscitated, they're going to resuscitate you because the proxy trumps everything at all times. Okay, so how do you get a, a health care proxy then? Many of you are going to tell me that you have them, right? And maybe they're just grand, uh, but don't tell me you have them because you went to the hospital it was in, and they had you sign one there. Because when you did that and you left the hospital, they threw it away, right? So, and, and, and by signing that one, by the way, you revoked all previous ones. Every time you sign a health care proxy, you thereby revoke all previous health care proxies. So what you probably want to do is you want to have a health care proxy that you're kind of keeping with you at home. You make a, have a copy made for your doctor so that if you're going to the hospital, if, if, you, don't, if you can't find it or you're, whoever's going with you can't find it, they can always call your doctor and he can scan, send one, he can email one or whatever. To have a health care proxy, all you have to have is a document signed by two witnesses. It does not have to be notarized. The witnesses can be anybody. The proxy can be anybody except somebody who works at the hospital or if you're in a nursing home, at the nursing home, unless in those cases that person is related to you by blood. Um, once, once, you've done, once you've got that, pro that proxy and your doctor has, de has declared in writing that you are incapable of making a medical decision, then the proxy takes your place and can make all medical decisions for you at any time. So why wouldn't you do a proxy? There's only one reason anyone has ever consistently raised, and that is, I don't want my daughter sending me to the, I shouldn't put, I don't want my son sending me to the nursing home, right? Um, because they're worried that they're, by signing this document, they're kind of losing this power. And it is true that the decision to, to, to put you in a nursing home is a medical decision. And therefore, if your doctor has said you're medically incapable of making medical decisions, then your daughter um, could put you in the nursing home, right? Except that if you go to the nursing home with her to be admitted and she says, I want you to stay, and, and you say, well, no, I don't want to stay. Well, there's actually a case on that, uh, and which says that at that moment, what you've done is you revoked your health care proxy. You have revoked it. Uh, and therefore, you can't stay in the nursing home at that point is supposed to say, the island home is supposed to then say, well, sorry, we can't admit you. Go back home. Unless there's a court order, right? So you're not losing that control by signing the proxy. Now, whenever I say this, though, this always really depresses all those people who are on the other side of that equation. They're like, but yeah, Ma's really losing her grip, and what if I need to send her to the nursing home, you know? And I'll tell them, well, you know, usually the problem doesn't happen. I have only had seen it happen a couple of times in my life. Um, usually people get kind of talked into staying in the nursing home. But I'm just telling you, from your perspective, if you object to being in the nursing home, um, that revokes the proxy. You can revoke the proxy at any time. Um, the proxy is the one, actually, the one document that you sign that actually survives you and continues to be valid after your death as to one thing, and that is whether your body or any pieces of it can be donated to the New England Organ Bank, which is the, the region-wide uh, entity. It's actually a real place in Waltham, Massachusetts, right, um, which is in charge of finding bone and tissue and things from people and giving them out to other people. Um, you, you may think that the only time that that would happen regarding your body is if you have signed something on your license or done something with the registry of motor vehicles or whatever, but that's not the case. Actually, uh, as a result of a change in the law that occurred a few years ago, your proxy is still in control of your body. So if you have a concern about that, you don't want to do that, then you want to, that's one of the few, that is actually an instruction that you do want to have in your healthcare proxy. Any other instructions in your proxy are all irrelevant because your proxy is, is, can do whatever he or she wants. But that one, which only it takes effect after you're dead, right, would bind your proxy, okay? And, oh, by the way, one other piece of trivia. So tell your proxy, if you're dead, 
and the New England Organ Bank calls to say, do you want to donate the body, make sure you return the call because um, the, the ho hospitals and nursing homes and other institutions are not allowed actually to release your body to you or to your family for cremation or whatever until the New England Organ Bank has said it's okay. They're supposed to check with the, with the New England Organ Bank to make sure that the organ bank has checked with you and that you know, they don't need the body. Okay? So that's uh, healthcare proxies. The MOLST form, Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment, MOLST. The MOLST form, the most, there are two signatures on the MOLST form, yours, but that's not an important one, and your doctor's, that's the important signature. Because technically what a MOLST form is, is an order, it's a medical order for life-sustaining treatment. It's a medical order from your doctor. So uh, legally what that does is it gives everybody down the medical food chain, right? It tells them what to do. Only the doctor gets to give legal or medical advice. So this tells the EMT that shows up in your house if you're lying on the floor, uh, or it says the nurses that you're in, if you're in the hospital. It tells all of them what to do or not do. That's why your doctor needs to sign it. And your doctors all have these, right? And, the D and DPH, the Department of Public Health, has been pushing your doctors to talk to you about this, these. But until fairly recently, they didn't bring it up a lot. And I, would think one of the reasons that they weren't getting paid for it, right? That CMS, Medicare, uh, the entity that controls Medicare, until this past January 1st, that there was not a CMS code to get, so the doctor could get paid for having this conversation. But CMS finally changed that, right? And as of now, if you go see your doctor, he'll get paid, he or she will get paid for up to 30 minutes worth of talking to you about these issues. So it's really important, really important. Now, Whatever it says in your, in your MOLST form, remember, healthcare proxy can always overrule that. Finally, once you have one, where do you put it? Only one place, on the refrigerator. Why is that? Is that in the law? No, it's because every ambulance driver has been trained in that protocol. They walk into the house, they see you on the floor, they're, gonna, they're in a hurry, right? They gotta do something, so they're gonna look on the refrigerator, and if there's no MOLST form there, they're just going to do what they otherwise would automatically do, which is try to make you better and get you to the hospital. So what are some of the things in the most form? I'm going to give you the three that I think are really kind of the obvious big ones. CPR, do not resuscitate. What does that mean? It means if my heart has stopped, don't try to make it start again. Now, we have talked about the fact that, that, that that's obviously a difficult decision to make, because if your heart has stopped, right, in general, you really want to make them try to start it again, right? Um, but it's really, really painful, right? Because what they need to do to make your heart start is they need to kind of push through your ribs, pretty much breaking them, right? To try to make your, kind of move your heart to get it to go again. Or they have to electroshock you to kind of make the heart go. It really hurts, which is worth it if you're going to live, right? But, but if you don't live, what it, what it amounts to is an incredibly painful way to die, right? Because this is the last thing you're feeling before you die. So it, it, it was always interesting in that regard. I quote a statistic that was given to me. I didn't read this study, but a gerontologist who might have done this presentation with told me she read a study recently from one of the Canadian hospitals that said, based on national data that said that your chances of surviving by more than 30 days if you are over 70 and have CPR administered to you is 5%. 5%, one out of 20. So when you're thinking about whether you want to say that you want CPR, think about that. Just think about that. It's your decision. That's what the most form is for. It's your decision. And of course, tell your proxy so that she won't overrule your decision. Um, intubation. Intubation is, I have stopped breathing. Try to make me start breathing by taking a tube and putting it down my throat into my lungs and then pushing air into it to try to make me go. Well, that's not a real pleasant experience either. So you want to kind of think about whether that's the kind of, and as, as uh, um, I work with a lot of geriatric care managers, people who work with elders a lot, and they'll tell you one of the issues when you're in the hospital is it's a lot easier to not put the tube in than it is to get the tube out, right? Doctors are really hesitant about extubation, about taking, a, uh, taking that tube that's in you and taking it out, right? So you want to think about that. And finally, and, and there are a number of other decisions like that for you to look at in the most form. But finally, my, my most important one is do not hospitalize. Frank and Mary want to die and be buried in the backyard. They want to die at home. They don't want to die in the hospital. They don't want to die on machines. They want to die at home. 
So if, if you're on the floor in the kitchen and the, the, guy, the medic comes in, you don't want to go to the hospital if that's what you want, you know? Because we all know, I, so I always talked about the fact I love working with elders because we all get the fact that we're going to die. You know, your kids don't. They don't think it'll ever happen. So, and what you fear most is really in many ways not death, it's this frailty. It's this deterioration in life. So if you don't want that, then you don't want to go to the hospital, okay? So those are the decisions. You need to make them. You need to do a most for them. And now you all know what they are. And maybe others will remember the next time. We'll have this test again next spring, and we'll see. Um, the alternative to this, for someone to make medical decisions, for, to, be, to have the legal right to make medical decisions for you, if they don't have a proxy, they have to get a guardianship. It's going to take months. It's going to cost a load of money. And it's just useless. I mean, it's a waste. You get this healthcare proxy done for practically nothing, you know, and it resolves these problems. Finally, power of attorney. Power of attorney gives someone the power to act on your behalf regarding whatever you say in the power of attorney they can do. Most powers of attorney are just general powers of attorney and say, you can do whatever I could do. So you're giving the attorney the ability to do whatever you could do. As opposed to the proxy, which only takes effect when the doctor says you're incapacitated, the power of attorney takes effect right away, right? Unless you've actually said in your power of attorney, I only want this to take effect if I've become incapacitated. But you never want to do that, right? Because it just confuses everybody. The, the, the reason a power of attorney, and you've been here before, so you've heard some of my standard jokes. I always tell, my, I mention, no, it's not a joke, it's a line. My daughter, who is getting married next weekend, she's now a lawyer, big time, Wilmer Hale, you know, from Boston, and marrying another lawyer. So when she was in high school, she once gave me, she gave me a t-shirt. The good lawyer knows the law, the great lawyer knows the judge. Now, in the case of a power of attorney, you know, and there's a lot of truth to that, you know, in many ways, but the great thing, in the case of a power of attorney, the judge is never a real judge or even a lawyer. It's like the lady at the bank, you know, or your insurance agent, or, and they're looking at this document. Oh, is this valid? You know, I'm not sure if this is valid. So you want a document that really looks valid, right? So does it have to be notarized? Well, unless your attorney is being authorized, this happened the last time I did this. I'm sorry, sorry, I'm gonna kill that. This is always embarrassing to have to do on screen, right? Killing my phone. I'm gonna shut it off so this will never happen again. But you know, it's not as bad as that guy that's pounding the nails in the back. So, um, so, you've got, so, so does it have to be notarized only if the document is going to be used because you're going to sign a deed on someone's behalf or a mortgage or something that gets recorded in the registry? Otherwise, it doesn't have to be notarized. Does it have to be witnessed? No. Do you want, oh, unless you're using it in some other states. In Massachusetts, no witnesses are necessary. In Florida, two are. Uh, Florida actually has their own little magic form for powers of attorney, uh, which you definitely want to do if you're going to Florida because they won't take ours. Um, do you want to get them notarized anyway? Yes. Why is that? Because there's something, I've learned this, at this I've been practicing now 39 years, and I've learned that, that the appearance of, of, of a document really being legal is as much important as whether it's legal, because no one really knows, right? And there's something about a notary seal. Some documents have been notarized. Everyone goes, ooh, that's really a legal document, right? So you want your, your, your power of attorney notarized just because everybody thinks that makes it legal. It doesn't, right? but it makes it look more official. The other thing is you should try to make it kind of as new as possible. We always recommend have your power of attorney be less than five years old. We actually did have a case last week um, where there was, a, there was an investment company that is refusing to take a power of attorney that is one year old. It's a durable power of attorney, a, a, a power that's supposed to survive your incapacity. A and I was talking to the person saying, well, how can, how can you, you do this? You know, I've got a person who, you know, can't deal with issues. That's why she did the power of attorney, you know. Oh no, this is the bank rule, you know. So, and the point is, once again, they're the judge. You know, now I have to talk to that person's supervisor. Do I want to talk to his chief counsel, you know. So tr try to make it fresh. The only other thing is regarding the terms, you want to make sure if you want to allow gifting uh, by the attorney, make sure that's in the document. Otherwise, the attorney is not presumed to have the power to gift assets on your behalf to somebody else. The reason why that's really important for me um, is when I am re trying to re help people rearrange their assets because someone needs nursing home care so we need to shift assets around usually to the spouse in order to qualify that person for mass health or other programs. 
But if, unless the attorney, and the attorney in that case is typically the spouse, but unless it's in the power of attorney that the spouse has the ability on behalf of that other spouse to make gifts, and unless it specifically says that they can self-deal, that the husband has the right on the wife's behalf to give assets to the husband, they can't do it. The reason why that's really important is you'll find many powers of attorney are written by, have been written by attorneys who are mainly focused on financial issues, typically estate tax and gift tax minimization. So often there will be a clause in that power of attorney that says that my attorney cannot make gifts that are greater than the federal gift tax exemption. And we're not going to talk about gift taxes, this, except that the number's $14,000 this year. Well, that power of attorney just killed me with, with, with a client recently, because I've got a spouse, I've got a wife that's in the nursing home. We're trying to shift all the assets to the husband so that she can qualify for mass health, thereby cutting that nursing home bill down, uh, keeping the, burnt, the, the, the payment that she's now making of $14,000 a month, getting rid of that. But it turns out this power of attorney has, does, has one of those clauses that says that gifting, the maximum gift is this $14,000 a month, which means we have to go get a conservatorship um, in court, a conservatorship. Takes you about three months, gonna cost this people about five or $10,000. But the most significant thing about that is the three months, right? It's gonna take three months. The nursing home bill is $14,000 a month. So this is gonna cost these people 10,000 in legal fees and $42,000 in nursing home costs while we try to get the conservatorship approved. It all would have been avoided if they had a power of attorney that allowed gifting. Finally, your power of attorney, you can, as opposed to the healthcare proxy where you can only name one person at a time, in your power of attorney, you can name many people at the same time. You can name them jointly, right? If you don't trust anybody and you wanna make sure everybody signs off, or you can name them jointly and severally, which is the most common, so you say, you know, my, my, I, I name my, my wife and my kids, my two kids, and any one of them can act on my behalf. So if people aren't, no one's around, you can still get the power of attorney done, okay? That's power of attorney, that's conservatorship. Now, we were just talking about probate. Um, remember, probate only affects the assets that are held by individuals in individual names. So in the Frank and Mary case, if Frank dies, is a probate necessary? If Frank dies and Mary's still alive, is a probate necessary? Raise your hand if you think a probate is necessary. No. You're saying no, you're saying no, you're both correct. No probate is necessary. They own the house jointly, so when he dies, his interests evaporate, she becomes the sole owner. Same thing with the bank account and the annuity. The IRA, while it looks like it's his account, and, and it can't, uh, IRAs can't be joint, they can only be in the name of the person whose ta taxable income has been deferred, right? It isn't really his. It looks like it's his. They sent him a bank statement, but it isn't really. It's really the banks or the investment company, and, the, and, and those folks have certain obligations to give him the money, but it's not his yet. So it's kind of like a life insurance policy. And, 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 and it always has a death beneficiary provision. So as long as, you have, as long as Frank, in this case, has done the death beneficiary, probably naming Mary, when he dies, no probate will be necessary. The only problem would have occurred if Mary had died before Frank and Frank still had her named as the death beneficiary, in which case Mary dies, then Frank dies, but Mary's already dead, and so there's no one to give the money to, right, unless there's a contingent beneficiary in there, right, and so then it goes back into Frank's estate. So in general, there's no probate there, but if Mary then um, dies, well then, in that case, um, there would be a probate. Right, because everything had shifted to Mary and then Mary dies. And then, so at that point the question is, after Frank has died, when Mary's alive, at that point does she need a will? And once again the answer is no, as long as she just wants to leave things to the three kids. So the question is, is that what she wants? And so she needs to ask these questions. Does any of those kids have creditor problems? Because if so, by leaving it to the child, you're really leaving it to their creditors, right? Because they're gonna go get the money. Uh, is there a, a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law that you never could stand anyway, and you're worried that you're gonna die and leave the money to your child, and then there's gonna be a divorce? Because then that money's gonna be in play and become part of the divorce settlement. Uh, or does your child have a disability? Is there some reason that your child is now on a government program that has an asset limit to it, or might need one, like Mass Health? In any of those cases, instead of leaving property to your child, you probably wanna leave it in trust for the benefit of your child. Typically, you'd name one of your other kids as the trustee. 
Because as long as your child, who may have one of these problems, can't get the money, doesn't have the legal right to just go get the money, then it's not subject to his creditor claims or the divorce claims and does not, and does not get counted as an asset for purposes of maintaining his disability claims. Finally, the house. In the Frank and Mary case, they want to, they want to, when you die, I want to sell everything and divide everything among the, I want to sell, I want to, I want to divide everything among the kids. Now, in most cases, what that means is, in the case of the house, I want to sell the house and divide the money among the kids. But if the will simply says everything gets divided among the kids, then legally what happens is the kids are entitled each to become owners of the house. And so now you have a house that's got three owners, right? So I just had this happen. I had a call coming on the way, back, on the way down here, right? Um, and so there is a, there's one child that's living in the house, right, and has been taking care of mom, right? Um, and, but mom said, um, so I want, you know, when I die, I want, the, you know, I want everything divided equally among the, uh, among the four kids. So now, what's going to happen to the house? The one that's living in the house doesn't want to have the house sold. The other three really want to have the house sold. But if all four kids own the house, everybody has to sign the deed, right? Otherwise, the can't get, house can't get sold. So if the question is, it's a Nantucket house, right? And so you die, and so you know that the house is only worth a million dollars. But the, the one that's at your child in San Francisco thinks, oh, this thing must be worth five million. It's Nantucket, you know? And so they can't agree to a price. Well, what happens? You can't sell the house because everybody's got to sign the deed. The only way you can sell the house is if someone files a petition to partition real estate gets a court order to sell the house, spends a boatload of money, and spends about a year in court, right? So in that case, instead of saying, in, instead of, you, you may, she may want to have a will, and the will may want to, you may want to say, when I die, sell the house and divide up the money, as opposed to simply um, give it equally to the kids. Once again, if there is no will, automatically the kids get interest in the house, and so you have these problems. Probate avoidance. So how can she avoid probate if she doesn't want to have to go through it? By the way, probate, the probate process, there's this probate remains this kind of boogeyman. Oh, I don't want to go through probate. You know, it's so expensive. It takes forever. Well, the probate process, unless some of your kids are fighting about it, it's going to take about a year. And it's going to cost about five to seven thousand dollars in probate costs. Uh, the reason why it takes a year is not because your attorneys are lazy. I know that mostly people assume that. It is because from the day that you die, any assets that go in through probate are subject to the claims of your creditors. If I get into a car accident and I run over you and I live, you have three years from the day that I have run over you, um, even if you're dead, your estate has three years, to sue me. If, on the other hand, I run over you and I die, um, um, your you, have, you have one year to sue my estate to try to get paid, right? Now, because of that, assets can't get distributed for that year. So the, one of the disadvantages of probate is that it does kind of stick assets in the middle for a year. So how do you avoid it? Well, if, you're, if, you're, um, if you were Frank and Mary, remember joint ownership is away. If you're just Mary, you remember what her assets were. Well, she could put her kids' names on the house, right? She could own the house jointly with her kids so that when she dies, her interests evaporates. She could have a life estate in the house. She could basically say, I want it, not basically, this is what a life estate means. I'm going to own the house until I die. Um, I'm going to still have the obligation to pay the taxes and the insurance and all that stuff, and no one can live here except me unless I say it's okay. But when I die, at the moment of my death, my interest evaporates, poof. And therefore, the property doesn't go through probate, right? Um, um, regarding cars, an automobile, um, if, you, if you're a husband and wife and you die owning an automobile in your name, there is a special state statute that says that it's presumed that the spouse is the surviving joint owner. So the spouse can just bring the death certificate and the marriage certificate down to the registry, and they'll switch the car into the other name. If, Mary, if Frank were dead, though, and Mary were alive, the car would be a problem. Um, and that's actually one of the most common little things that makes people go through probate, is they haven't dealt with the car. So the way to deal with it, typically, would be to put it in joint names. Have, you know, have her name one of her kids as a surviving joint owner of that car. Now, a lot of times the kids will say, I don't want to be in the title with Ma. She can't drive, you know, she's 85. So in that case, you know, you've got to increase your insurance to convince your child that they want to do that, right? But anyway, that's, that's a way. What about the stuff in the house? So because technically, when you die, all of the stuff in, in the house is just owned by you. 
and so the rules for how to distribute it are really supposed to be determined through the probate process. Never happens. Now I've been doing this for 39 years now. I've yet to have that happen. I have, a, I have, one, I have an associate who this did happen. There was a major fight costing about $30,000 in legal fees over a cardboard Santa. That, but so you could see there were some other issues going on in this family. Um, but for folks who don't think that that's an issue, what you, you know, the stuff in the house isn't going to be a problem. If you're concerned about this, if you're concerned, uh, then one way to handle it would be simply to a letter to your kids that says, dear kids, here's how I want you to deal with the property, with this stuff, because the rest of the world doesn't care about that stuff, right? The rest of the world cares if you've got a title to the car because the Registry of Motor Vehicles want to knows who, wants to know who own, owns it. If I'm buying a house, I want a deed and I want to know that I'm getting the house that the from the people that were named on that deed and so I care. But the personal property, no one cares unless it's like a Picasso, you know? And so, it, so you've got a buyer that is very interested in the provenance of that. You want, they want to show the chain going back to Picasso, right? But in other cases, don't worry about it. Another thing that you can do uh, if you're concerned about this, and you want, and you've, especially if you've got one child that you're leaving the stuff to, like you're leaving them the house and you're also leaving them the contents, right? Is you could do a deed. A, 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 technically, a deed is a, is a document that shows that you are conveying your title to property. Uh, we think of deeds only as associated with real estate, but that's just, that's historically, that's evolved over time. It used to be that chattel deeds, were used a lot to sell cows and horses and all kinds of stuff. But they were also used, and, and so the, the technical easiest, the, what you would do legally is you would give someone a chattel deed to the property in your house, right? A lot of people are offended by that term, though, that, because that's how you sold slaves, right? Because that's what slaves were. They were chattel, and so that's how the transactions occurred. And so the term chattel deed, people stopped wanting to use that. That's how this notion occurred of bills of sale for a dollar. An, uh, an evidently self-contradicting term. Who would ever sell something for a dollar, right? So the reason why it's a bill of sale for a dollar is that it's really a chattel deed in another form, right? Okay, so that's, so you can avoid, there are a number of ways of avoiding probate, or the one that you most commonly hear about, you can create a trust. If Mary's the sole survivor and she's concerned about making sure the property gets done, done distributed the way she wants to, but she wants to keep control of everything while she's alive, the way for her to do that is to create a trust. A trust describes a relationship between two kinds of people, trustees and beneficiaries. The trustee is the legal owner of the property that's in trust, holding it for the benefit of the beneficiaries, those other people. So she would create a trust, name herself as the beneficiary together with her kids, but say right in the trust, as long as she's alive, everything's revocable, amendable, she can do whatever she wants. But at the moment of her death, Everything becomes irrevocable and unamendable, and one of her kids is named as the, tr the successor trustee and told what to do with the property. In this case, sell everything and divide it between the three kids, or among the three kids. She does that, and she conveys her house into trust, and the bank accounts, then upon her death, no probate would be necessary, except for the car. Remember, you've got to deal with the car, because you can't put a car in trust. Um, this trust, um, it, basically, you're just keeping all control of everything, right? So it's actually, as far as the IRS is concerned, it's as if the trust doesn't exist. There's no special tax rules, tax returns. You're taxed ex on that property exactly the way you would be if you just owned it. So if you do that with your home, and then you go sell the home as the trustee of this trust, as far as the government's concerned, it's still your house. You still get your capital gains. You know, you get your exemption. You get all that stuff. Um, it's also... Uh, still yours for mass health purposes. So if you do this, and then you need nursing home care, this asset's still going to be a countable assets, asset, and it will be required that the property get reconveyed back to you individually, and mass health will put a lien on that house, or if it's rental property or whatever, they may, they may ask you to sell it. So um, uh, it doesn't help you. And the reason why I mention that is oftentimes people, when they were younger, will have done this kind of created this kind of trust for probate avoidance purposes, then they get older and they don't change anything and someone needs nursing home care and the kids come to see me and say, so with this property is in trust, so we're all set, right? I'll say, well, no, actually, this trust, revocable and amendable, doesn't give you any protection at all. So that's not why you would do it. Which leads into the next big topic that people talk to me a lot about. This is Mass Health 101. So my clients either 
are worried about getting Alzheimer's or they have it or one of their, their relatives has it. That's the vast majority of my clients, right? And they're worried because they know that the, bi the biggest thing that could really affect the total value of their estate or of what they're going to give their children is not estate taxes. Even if your estate is, if it's a million dollars or less, there's no estate tax. Even if it's $2 million, the total estate tax on $2 million is less than $100,000, right? It's being in a nursing home for any prolonged period of time, right? Because one year at our island home is more than the entire estate tax burden on that $2 million estate, right? Because the island home, about 150, more than 150,000 a year, I think, now, right? So people are very interested in this issue. So we're going to talk about this. Now, I'm sorry if I'm boring some of the folks that have seen this before, right? But remember, if you're Frank and Mary, and you've got those assets, there's the house, the IRA, all that stuff. Now, if Mary needs nursing home care, Raise your hand if you feel that, that some of those assets, whoops, those assets need to get spent down before Mary can qualify for Mass Health. Mass Health being the program that will pay for the nursing home care. Raise your hand if you think we're going to need to spend down some of this money. Oh, now you folks haven't been here before, right? You don't, actually, that's not the case. That's not the case. As long as, even though you hear on the radio, the only way you can save your assets from nursing homes is transfer it out of your name into an irre irrevocable trust, wait five years. That does not apply if you're married, right? If you're married and Frank and Mary needs nursing home care, to qualify for MassHealth, Mary has to show that she's poor because MassHealth or Medicaid is, the, is, is, is insurance for the poor. But she doesn't have to show that Frank's poor, right? So she has to have less than $2,000 in countable assets, right? But Frank can own the house, can have other cash or cash equivalent assets of up to $119,220, and most importantly, can have unlimited income, unlimited income. So if Mary is in the nursing home and Frank comes to me and says, oh, geez, I didn't do anything. What am I going to do? I say, well, it's very simple. We're going to shift everything to you. We're going to shift the home to you. Oh, the home can't have an equity of greater than $828,000. And so if you're on Martha's Vineyard, one of the things you want to think about doing is getting a reverse <coughs> mortgage on your house. So that if you end up in the nursing home, right, um, and there's two of you, and one of you is in the nursing home, we can shift to the other person and then use the reverse mortgage to pull equity out of that house so we can get the equity down below $828,000. That's, that's a kind of, it's really important in Nantucket because, well, you know, that some of these your properties are just crazy valuable, right? So it allows you or it allows your spouse to be able to keep that house by keeping below that $828,000 figure. And then they would, they would take the cash they'd take out, that they would take out of the reverse mortgage and do exactly what I'm going to tell you regarding the rest. So anyway, Frank's house is all set. His money, though, he's got too much money, right? He's got $325,000 there in money, and he can only have $119,220. So what he needs to do with the rest of that money is he needs to buy an annuity. What is an annuity? An annuity is a contract with an insurance company. You give them money and they promise to give it back to you with some interest. Not a lot of interest. You'd never do this as an investment, right? But as long as the purchase of that annuity calls for monthly payments back to Frank in equal monthly installments over a term that is shorter than his actuarial life expectancy, and if Frank right now is, say, 85 years old, his life expectancy is about seven years. Um, as long as those are the terms, then the purchase of that annuity in any amount, in any amount, is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. So even you, living on Nantucket, can get qualified for mass health, right? So in, so in this case, Frank would take basically, he'd look at his $325,000, he'd probably keep like $100,000. And he'd take the rest and buy that annuity. And the day after he bought the annuity, Mary would qualify for MassHealth. And, and those payments would be coming to him, and if Frank subsequently died, MassHealth would have no claim on any of that money as to anything paid on Mary's behalf. So um, we would transfer the house to Frank, we would transfer the other assets to Frank, and then Frank would buy that annuity. And the next day, Mary qualifies for MassHealth. So the only um, problem in that situation, though, is, so what happens if um, Mary has died? I'm going to see if this, oh, I haven't got those. Yes. What happens uh, if Frank has died? Uh, and then Mary's trying to qualify for Mass Health. Well, if Frank has died and, and, and he's got the estate plan we talked about before and he left everything to Mary, and now Mary's trying to qualify for Mass Health, well, now she's got a problem, right? She's got way too much cash, right? 
um, and, and which is all going to have to get spent down to $2,000, at which point she'll qualify for MassHealth, but MassHealth will put a lien on the house, right? The way that she avoids that um, is by, or the way that Frank can avoid that, either before or after Mary goes to the nursing home, and that's why this is kind of the most common uh, estate planning tool that is used by folks whose big issue is these issues. Um, is Frank would have a will that instead of saying, when I die, Mary gets everything, Frank would say, when I die, everything is going to go in trust for Mary's benefit. I'm going to name one or more of my kids as the trustees. Um, and as long as I've done that, and by the way, if Mary and Frank were both healthy, I'd have both people do those wills right now. They wouldn't have to necessarily put the assets in one person's name or the other because they don't know who's going to die first. In this situation, if Mary's in the nursing home and we're shifting everything to Frank, at that point we'd have Frank do that will. And then if Frank subsequently dies, all those assets that would have gone to Mary and therefore knocked her off mass health and had to be spent will all be safe. 100% of the assets will be safe. And the money that is in trust for her benefit can be used to do anything that the trustees want, like the kids, to supplement her care, to improve her care at the nursing home. And following her death, Mass Health will have no lien on any of this money and they can just go to the kids, right? Now, in order to do something like that, if you're trying to get things protected early, you want to have those wills with asset protection trust. Um, you also want to have, make, make sure now that Mary has executed a power of attorney. Remember we talked about that? Because if Mary were in the nursing home, we want to make sure that Frank has a power of attorney from her so that he can get the assets out of her name and into his name, right? Otherwise, Mary's going to get stuck having to spend down that money, right? Um, and they may want to do early asset shifting. If you've got a couple, typically I suggest, if you've got a couple where one person has, a lot, has had a lot of heart problems um, or is much older than the other spouse, so there is a strong likelihood that that person's going to die before the other spouse. And I always tell them, well, then you may want to put the assets in that person's name after you've got those wills set up. It being understood that the transfers into the name of the first person to die can literally happen the day before they die. So you don't have to do any of that restructuring early. And if you're Frank and Mary, you keep control of all the assets. Uh, I think we did that one. Um, so you cannot avoid probate and at the same time do this kind of asset protection. In order to, to accomplish what I just described, the money has to be in Frank's name before he dies. It has to pass as a result of his will into a testamentary trust, right? So for folks who are coming in saying they want asset protection but they also want to avoid probate, I have to tell them, I can't do that if you're a couple, okay? Uh, now if Frank is dead and now it's just Mary that's alive, and she comes in, and this often happens, happened last week. Um, I do nothing but this kind of work now, and as a result, I just see a lot of people. So problems that I would occasionally see a few times a year now, I tend to see a few times a month, you know. Lady came in, oh, I really want to, with her kids, I really want to protect my assets now, my husband just died. And I'll tell her, I said, well, you know, we could have done some great things about a month ago, you know, before your husband died, but now you are stuck with what you hear about on the radio. You have to lose control of your assets and wait five years. That's the only way you're going to protect these assets in the event that you need nursing home care. Um, if, that's, if that was Frank and Mary's assets, we already talked about those. Um, if they were just Mary's, then what she needs to do, there are two kinds of assets here. There's the house and there's everything else, right? So for the house, the most common way of dealing with that is that Mary will deed out a so-called remainder interest in the house and keep the life estate because Mary does not want to lose control of the house while she's alive. Now the least expensive way to do that, and it works fine as long as you've got kids that you really trust, right, is to simply do a deed that deeds the remainder interest to the three kids and has Mary keep a life estate. And five years after that deed has been recorded in the registry, the remainder interest in that property, the part that's owned by the kids, is safe if Mary then needs nursing home care. Uh, Ma Mary would qualify for MassHealth. MassHealth would lean, put a lien on her life estate, but following her death, that lien, her life estate evaporates. We already talked about that. And therefore, so does the lien, because the lien was only on the life estate. So that's, that, that is one way of doing it. Um, the second way uh, is to actually create a trust, naming one of the kids as the trustee for the benefit of the others. This was the case if, you wanna, if you're nervous about deeding it to all the kids right, that maybe they won't get along, we talked about that. So you've got one child that you really trust, 
and so you deed it to them as the trustee of this trust. You deed this remainder in trust, keep the life estate, five years following the date that you've done that, the, 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 uh, the remainder in trust part of the house is safe. Regarding other assets, you can simply uh, give them away to your kids, or if you're a little nervous about that, right, you would do a, a similar kind of trust to what we were just describing, what you, but what you would say in the trust is you would give your kids the power um, to basically distribute money to themselves. You can't be a beneficiary if you want this money to be non-countable. But you give the kids the power to distribute money to themselves, and you tell them, now you be good kids. If I let you take, you take some of this money, you've got to give it back to me if I need it. Right? So this only works if, kid, if you've got kids that you trust. I always tell people, you know, that's why they call them trusts. You know, you've got to trust the trustee. Um, I say avoid irrevocable trusts um, because, in general, more and more of these trusts have been getting challenged. Um, and, and specifically, trusts in which that mechanism was there, where money was transferred into a trust, and there was a provision that said the trustee could, in the trustee's discretion, make distributions to the kids. Or even kind of more egregious, when there was a provision in there that said that you, as the elder, actually retain the power while you're alive to order di distributions to the kids. Because more and more mass health case workers have been saying, well, wait a minute, this is just a game, you know, which of course it is. That's the reason why you did it, right? So that you could keep the money, kind of, while getting it so that it wasn't countable. And so this was happening increasingly, and there were several superior court cases over the last two years in which the superior courts on appeal have been backing up the decisions of the case workers at Mass Health uh, to do this. And then last month came this case, and that's the case I handed out to you. It's called Hein versus Medicaid, H-E-Y-N versus Medicaid. Um, I gave you the case because, you know, sometimes it's actually interesting to read one of these cases, so you get a sense of, you know, how the judges kind of think this stuff out, right? Um, and in this particular case, that the trust that is referred to in that case, this is a case in which a, a little old lady had a house and transferred it to a trustee for the benefit of the kids and then went into the nursing home 10 years later. Um, and then and, and MassHealth said, oh no, that, that, that asset, that's in, the house that's in trust should still be counted because there was this kind of provision, those two provisions, that the trustee could make distributions directly to the other siblings and that the parent could order distributions, right? And in that case, the caseworker said, no, it's a countable asset. They appealed and went to Superior Court, and the Superior Court agreed that it was countable, and then it went to the Appeals Court. And the Appeals Court, in that decision, said, nope, it's okay. That trust, which I just described to you, which many of us in this business were saying, well, got to stay away from these because they were getting knocked out, that trust is okay. Now, there are still some provisions in these trusts that make those trusts, that, that cause us kind of agita and make us nervous about them. But I'm just mentioning that to you because where, whereas we had a lot of us that do this kind of work were convinced that this was just the kind of this inevitable train that was going to lead to irrevocable trust being useless. Now all of a sudden, looks like they're okay, right? So you may, you may want to have your attorney look at that trust. The, the provision that we don't think is okay um, is I, I just described to you the one that I think works great, where you transfer the property to an irrevocable trust, you keep a life estate. So you keep control while you're alive. There was another form of that in which the, the, the person wouldn't keep a life estate, would convey their entire interest to the trust, but the trustee was required to allow the older person to live there in the house rent-free for the rest of their lives. Now, it seems to me that and, and by the way, that, and that trust has given people some problems. Some of those have been declared invalid, and, and this case didn't deal with that. And it does seem to me that in that case, you've got a, you, there's a problem. Because what is a house? A house is the, that you're living in is the ability to live in the house. So the mere fact that you don't have title, but that a trustee is required to leave you in the house, not paying anything, that sounds like you still own the house. So anyway, that one to me is more questionable. But, these, but the ones where you can make these distributions to the kids, they all work. Uh, I, they, that was Hein versus Medicaid. That's what I just talked about. Interestingly, by the way, this plan, which causes assets to be transferred to a trust, um, does end up also avoiding probate. Because if all the assets are in trust and Mary then dies, there's no need for probate. Um, finally, one other piece of current law, and this is really current. Um, so um, there is... 
there is the, governor, but the governor's budget, which was proposed in February, contained the usual budget things, you know, a bunch of line items that said, here's, here's what I'm going to, this is what I want to buy and this is what I'm going to pay for it. And then it contained, like all of these budgets contain, a number of so-called outside sections. What's an outside section uh, is a section of the budget that doesn't call for a specific appropriation, but that has a fiscal impact. Because, for example, it creates a program with eligibility requirements, and you know that some people are going to go into that program, and therefore they're going to need money. Or, in this case, where it changes the law so as to increase mass health's ability to get money from the estates or from the assets of people who are on mass health. So the current currently, currently, in the Mary, Frank and Mary situation, even if Mary had kept her joint interest in her house with Mary, once the other uh, uh, with Frank rather, once she had spent down her assets down below two thousand dollars, she qualified for Mass Health, and when she died, Mass Health would have a claim only on that two thousand dollar account that she kept that was in her name, or if she had kept an account in Frank and Mary's name, they wouldn't even have a claim on that to recover what they had paid on Mary's behalf. Uh, in addition to that, uh, and, 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 and they would not have any lien on that house because Frank had become the sole owner and their interest never went through probate. That's how current law works. And certainly, they would have no claim against Frank, right? Or upon his death against Frank's estate for anything, right? Because he was never in the nursing home, right? Well, except that's not what the new outside budget section does. What it does is it says that if you are on Mass Health, and this would apply to everybody that qualifies for Mass Health as of sometime in July this year, uh, because this is the budget. So the budget, as I always tell people, there's a lot of bills that go to the legislature and they kind of never see the light of day. They just go in and it's kind of this magic land and it goes to study committees and 10 years later no one's heard of it. The budget though, ooh, the budget always gets passed because otherwise no one's getting paid July 1st. So the budget will get passed. Um, as, as to whether or not this section of the budget, so-called outside section 11, is in it, that's a different question. So outside section 11 would sa says, if you qualify for Mass Health after this particular date, and when you die, you have an interest in real estate, even if it's an interest that won't go to probate, because it's a joint tenancy, like Frank and Mary with her house, or it's a life estate, like we were just talking about. Mass Health, after you die, will figure out what that value of that interest was the moment before you died, and Mass Health will have a claim against that house for that amount, for that value, right? That's a big change in the law. So in the case of Frank and Mary, and Mary still owns a joint interest in the house with Frank, when she dies, Mass Health's got a claim for 50% of the value of that house, right? Uh, if, she, if Mary's 85 years old and she has a life estate, her life estate value is going to be about 25% of the value of the house. Also, <clears throat> after Mary dies, if Frank then dies, right? Remember, he's inherited all, he's got all the assets now. If Frank then dies next day or next week or the next year or 10 years later, even if he's moved out of state or remarried, doesn't make any difference. Mass Health has a claim, a claim against all the probate assets in his estate, right? Now there's a big change, right? So the question is, so with that in mind, uh, two general observations. One, you want to follow this, right? This is going to have a big effect on you because nothing that you've done to this point, if you've done anything, is grandfathered under this, right? Two, um, uh, you may want to talk to your legislator about this, right? Because this is what the governor proposed. There was a, there was a, there was a, I was French Canadian and my, one of my, fo fo my father's lines was, l'homme propose et Dieu dispose. God, man proposes, God disposes. The legislature disposes. Only the governor just proposes. So in this case, um, this budget has to get through the House and the Senate, right? And the way that system works is the, both of them now have the budget. The House first does a, first the House uh, Ways and Means Committee uh, recommends a proposed budget to the House floor, and then the House votes on their budget. And then the Senate Ways and Means Committee proposes a version on their, of theirs and to the Senate, and then the Senate votes on their budget. Now, if, and, and then if there are any differences, then they get reconciled in a conference committee. You've heard this, these terms before, right? So in this case, uh, and, and if outside Section 11 is in both of those budgets, then it never goes to conference committee and it's passed. If it's out of both of those budgets, then it never goes to conference committee and it's dead. If it's in one but it's not in the other one, then it goes to conference committee. Now, where, it is, where this is right now is that the House Ways and Means Committee has made a recommendation regarding the House budget. 
and it excludes outside Section 11. They eliminated it from their budget. If the full House votes it that way, and then the Senate ends up voting it that way, it's gone, right? If the Senate ends up keeping outside Section 11 in its budget, then it's going to go to conference committee. Now, a lot of legislators um, have gotten a lot of calls from a lot of people regarding this, because a lot of people have done life estates and this other stuff dealing with these issues. And that's, I think, why it never made it out of the House Ways and Means Committee budget. But the Baker administration continues to support this and advocate for it so it's not dead. So you need to be following this. And if you're interested in this, especially if you have a life estate um, and you've done some of this planning, you may want to call your rep and your senator, right? Because they're going to decide. They dispose on this issue. Um, if, you've, if I said, if I talk too fast and you want to see this again or whatever, and you want to hear at the very same time the sound of the construction of the Nantucket Senior Center, the, you know, then you can watch this on cable right here, because Nant <coughs> Nant the folks from Nantucket Cable are kind enough to come to these shows. And also, Frank and Mary, my friends, have their own YouTube site, Elder Law Frank and Mary, so you can go see it anytime. <coughs> Any questions? And I know we covered a lot of material. <coughs> And I'm glad to take questions afterwards, by the way, also. Yes, ma'am? What's the difference between the DNR and the mold? The DNR, do, uh, do not resuscitate, uh, which they're trying to phase out, only covers that one issue. If you've stopped, if your heart has stopped, make it start. That's all it does. It doesn't deal with intubation, doesn't deal with any of these other issues. So you'll find that one of, that's one of the boxes you check in the MOLST form, is the do not resuscitate question. But then there are a whole bunch of others. Does that answer your question? But by the way, the creation of the most form has not in and of itself invalidated existing DNRs. They're just trying to encourage people to use the most form because it deals with so many more issues. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. Be careful when you start putting your children's name on the property, don't you? Oh, yeah, you do. You, I mean, the question is, do you have to be careful when your children's name go on the property? So I'll give you a case. Yeah. I'll give you two, both on, both on the other island. <clears throat> uh, a lady in, in uh, Vineyard Haven called me, wanted me to stop by. She had done this kind of planning. She had only one child. The ideal case for transferring the house, right, and keeping a life estate. You only had one child, so you knew the kids weren't going to fight about it and stuff. But she called me just because she said, so my, my, my son just got served with divorce papers. Is that a problem? I said, yeah, it is, because that remainder interest is his asset. And she's 85, so his asset is 75% of the value of her Vineyard Haven house. And that's now in play in the divorce. That's number one. Number two, Oak Bluffs. Um, was a wonderful older couple that was lived, grew up in, and lived in uh, Roxbury. And, um, and uh, then when they retired, like mid-60s, and they moved down to Oak Bluffs, right? But had a wonderful little house that they'd you know, always had. And so they, but then they wanted to make sure, because that's their big value, is their house, right? It's a beautiful house, close to the water. Um, so they said, well, you know, what I, we'll do is we'll transfer the house to the kids, the remainder interest, and we'll keep a life estate, which has worked great. You know, and 15 years have gone by, right? And, but now, though, they're getting older. They're in their mid-80s. They're still kind of okay, but they don't want to maintain this house anymore. They want to move back to Boston, right, where the family is. And, so, and that's their big asset, right? So now they want to, about well, under a million dollars, right? So now they want to sell their house. And so they called all their kids, right? And three of them are fine with it, right? But one isn't. They said, well, what, so what can we do? And I said, nothing. There's not a thing you can do. Not a thing you can do to make that child sell, that, sell out his interest. If you go to court and file a petition to partition, which you can do, right? The court will order the sale of the house, right? But you don't get the kid's share, right? The court's going to order the sale of the house, and they're going to give you the value of the life estate, which is 25% of the value of that property. The kids get the rest. And unless the kids are willing to give it back to you, you're stuck. So that's an issue. That's why it is more common, right, especially if there are multiple kids, and especially if the kids don't get along. It's more common to structure it as a trust. You name the one that you really trust as the trustee for the benefit of the others, but you know that that's the one you can trust. But once again, you've got to trust them, because you can't keep power over that trustee. Right? And still have it be valid. Any other questions? Because you've asked, and then I'll come back. When, when, uh, when, the, when they inherit the house, what is the cost basis on how they figure that? Is it the <coughs> question is, if, if, the, if, a, uh, if I'm getting it right, if the, if the parent has transferred a, a, a remainder interest to the kids 
or to a trust, to, or to a trust for the benefit of the kids, and the parent then dies, then for capital gains purposes, what happens to the basis of the house? The basis, okay, it, this, so it's capital gains 101. When you sell your house, you pay a capital gains tax on the difference between adjusted sales price, which is sales price minus commissions minus your lawyer, and adjusted basis. Basis, unless it's been a rental property, is basically what you bought it for, right? Except uh, if, if, if you die owning a piece of property, then in recognition of the fact that that property gets included in your estate for estate tax purposes at date of death value, in recognition of that, the government also says that your basis in that property jumps to the date of death value so that when your kids go to sell the house, they don't pay any capital gains tax unless they, pay, they sell it for more than it was worth when you died. And the answer is if you, if you transfer it either way and keep a life estate, the basis still jumps for estate tax purposes. So, we, so, that, so at the end of the day, in that, that life estate case, the kids get the, ca the house lien free, but with the, with the jump in basis. But it's also included in your estate for estate tax purposes. But once again, the, given the fact that unless you've got an estate that's worth, if you're just married, that's worth more than $5.4 million, and even in Nantucket, not everybody's got more than five point, no, the house is not that valuable, right? So it almost is always the case that it's better to pay the Massachusetts estate tax, which, where the rate's going to be 8 or 9%, right? And, and as a result of that, get the jump in basis, because otherwise you're paying a capital gains tax of 20 to 25%. Does that answer your question? No. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Last have, question. So you have a trust yeah. and a house. Yeah. And you have your trust with the money you bought. Yeah. The question is, if the, you've transferred the house to the trustee, to the child that you trust as the trustee, right? And then that, and then that trustee gets a divorce. Is that house at that point in play? No, right? Um, but if you want to be real safe on that, if you've got that kind of concern going down the line, name two of your kids as trustees, if you're fortunate enough to have two that you trust, and say that regarding the trust, no distribution can be made to anybody without the consent of both trustees, and that protects both of those children, because neither of them has the ability on their own to make a distribution, and therefore no court can force a distribution, because no court, unless, they've got a, unless they're a creditor of both of them, right, or divorcing both of them, so that's not going to happen, right? You're, you're, the, the protect, the case, in that case, the property would be protected. Does that answer your question? You. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. I'm sorry I had to talk a lot really fast, and we'll see you in the fall. Enjoy your summer. Thank you. Thank you.